everyone if you're watching this on Twitch live or later on YouTube welcome to the lecture um, today we will be talking about databases and Biomart um, so it's gonna be a two hour two and a half hour lecture and after that I will be using um, Biomart on one of the data sets that I've been analyzing this week um, because we are preparing to submit an abstract to the uh, BC Galp conference um, which is a conference um, which is about cows and goats and these kinds of things um, and this conference is hosted once every four years and you have to submit an abstract on what you're talking about um, so I did a little bit of preliminary work so a little bit of preliminary analysis on, on data that we um, got ourselves and that we got from collaborators and some open data um, so I, I think that it would be good to just go through there um, and show you guys um, well what I do when I work and that the stuff that I'm teaching you is something that I do use more or less not well not every day but on a weekly basis all right so first off happy new year to everyone um, this is our New Year's card that we send out so um, if you're important or important enough then you get to be on our mailing list and you get to get one of these really really beautiful Christmas cards um, unfortunately like did you get one Misha I, I don't know are you on our mailing list um, if not then um, tell me Oh yes, cool, cool, cool. Yeah, they're nice, right? Like we try to do like a theme every year. Of course, I have to give credit, like my moderator designs these, like I'm not skilled enough to do this. Um, so, but hey, everyone, um, I'm very happy new year and I hope 2022 will be a much, much better year than 2021. All right, so for today, like I told you guys, we will be talking about databases. So mostly I will be talking about things like how is a database organized, what type of features does it have, what different types of databases do we have, and then I want to talk to you guys about how to put data into a database and some do's and don'ts, so things like data normalization um, and some other tips and tricks when you're working with databases. Um, there will be a list of important biological databases which will be a little bit repetitive, right? We've seen a lot of databases already um, in the last like lectures so in the last nine lectures we've gone through a whole bunch of databases um, and I just want to highlight some of the most important ones and kind of give an overview um, so that you don't have to go through all of the old lectures but when I then ask a, a question on the exam like um, what's uh, oh, name three databases which are important for protein research um, then you can just have one slide where all of the databases are on um, and then I want to talk about Biomart. So Biomart is one of these tools that is really, really useful. It is a tool so that you can directly retrieve your data in, in R. Um, so it allows you to query uh, Ensemble and other big biological databases. And it's just a really, really useful tool when you're working with um, biological data and you want to just do some annotation or if you're interested in how many um, genes are located in a certain region in a certain species. Um, and the nice thing is you don't have to point and click, but Biomart allows you to just from our write code, which downloads the stuff. Um, and yeah, so you, it's, it's much easier than having to go through a database and making an Excel file yourself. Of course, like always, we start with the answers to the previous assignments. So um, it's been a while ago. So the last lecture was about primer design. Um, I hope that people did the assignments because it was very short. Uh, it's just designing a single primer for a single gene. Um, let me pull up the assignments. So the assignments, um, oh, I didn't make a window for that. So we'll just read them. Um, let me go to Firefox then because of course the first step in all primer design is getting a sequence to design a primer on. So of course getting a sequence means going to Ensemble um, and of course in Ensemble uh, we can select which species we want to work with. Why does it not go to the secure site? I don't like that it always defaults to the HTTP site. Um, so here we can just select our species. So for the assignments, uh, we were looking at uh, PPR. 
ARGC1A, uh, which is a bovine milk gene. It's a gene which is very important in uh, bovine milk production. Um, so mutations in this gene have a direct influence on um, how productive a cow is. Um, so we went to ensemble and then we have to look for the gene. Um, so I'm going to specify cow. Let me find that in the list for you guys. Um, cow, 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 where are you? Almost there. There are so many different species of animals. There is the cow. All right, and then we will just search for the gene. All right, so cattle gene located on chromosome 6. The location is, um, well, 43 megabases um, and it says minus one which means that it's on the negative strand so I hope that like we will look further into like this annotation and we will also be using this annotation um, when we will start downloading genes from ensemble, uh, from ensemble using Biomart. Um, but for the primer design I just wanted to first focus on the gene so the first question was when we look at uh, this PPARCG1 A gene how many transcripts does this gene have? So Ensemble is being a little bit slow today, but at least it shows me. Um, so you can see here that it, there are four different transcripts of this gene. So that means that, again, there's a single gene on the genome, and this gene is able to produce four different proteins. Um, so that's the first answer. So answer number one is how many transcripts are there? Four. Okay, so then the next step is go to the variation table, um, so called variant table. So let's go there as well. And again, it's a little bit slow, which is always annoying. Let me zoom out a little bit as well so that you can guys can more or less see the whole window. That's it. So now the bar is gone. So the question here is go to the variation table and look at the SNPs found. Um, how many SNPs are found when excluding SNPs in the introns? Right, so here we have the, um, um, the variation table. Um, so have what we can do is we can just clear all of the filters um, beforehand. And now we see that in total, does it give me a total? I don't know if it gives me a total in the bottom or on the top. It should give you a total on how many there are actually normally. Um, but I just can't see it. It might be out of frame though. Normally it tells you how many there are. Hello Xanax and welcome to the lecture. Welcome, welcome. Hope you had a good Christmas holiday. Um, so of course uh, we want to um, look at um, the, the SNPs which are inside of the transcript or inside of one of these variants. Um, hey, welcome moderator. Um, so um, we want to exclude SNPs which are in the intron. Um, so we just want to look here and there's in-frame deletions. And then we have coding sequence variants. We have three prime and intron variants. So we just say off. Right. So and also here we can see how many there are of each type. So we can see that in total this gene has no known variants which are causing an in-frame deletion, but there are 302 genes which are missense variants, which means that the mutation causes an amino acid change. Um, so of course, like the intron variants are the, the most, and that's generally the case, right? If we look at um, single nucleotide polymorphism, so little mutations into the DNA, the thing that we most often see is that these, or that these SNPs, these mutations occur in regions which are non-coding. Right, because non-coding regions do not have any selective pressure on them, but genes themselves do, right? So if you are a, a SNP and you're inside of a coding region, um, then you have a, an, an influence on the protein, um, which means you get a selective pressure because, of course, having a high amount of the protein or a low amount. So interestingly enough, it doesn't tell me how many there are in the table. But that's quickly solved by just clicking the download button, right? Um, so just click the download button if you're interested in it. Um, and it will give you an Excel file. And then, of course, we can just look at the uh, amount of lines in the file that we got. Um, so in total, there are 14,952 variants. This is not entirely true, of course because there are four transcripts. So a variant can be in one transcript, it can be in two, it can be in three. So hey, we can already see from the table um, that there will be some duplication. Um, so in this case, there's not, this one is not because they're all downstream variants. Um, so if we just look at it slightly differently, right? So instead of saying consequence all, oh, 
So we have to subtract 11,000. So that means that there's 14,953 minus 11,783. Um, but hey, if we look at the stop gain variance, um, so I want to say um, let turn all off and then only lose at the stop gains, right? Which are very important snips because now there's a, a, a premature end to the protein. Um, and then we can see that um, these variants should in theory have multiple transcripts associated with them. Uh, in this case, it doesn't seem to be. Well, that's good. At least then we can get an overview of all of the different SNPs. Um, so the question was how many SNPs are found when excluding SNPs in the introns? So that's around 3,000 something. You, can, you guys can do the math on that. Um, so the question now is, is we want to look at a single SNP called um, RS45045. Um, this is a splice site SNP. So I'm going to go consequence, turn all off, and then I'm going to look at the splice site. Um, splice site, splice region. Let me just select all of the splice. Splice site snip. All right, and then we just want to search for the um, snip that we are interested in, and then we find nothing. So instead of doing this, turn all of them on, and then search for this thing. All right, interestingly enough. All right, like turn all on. I have to click the apply button. I forgot that. So we just search for this snip. And this one should be in there again. So here we see what I was trying to show you guys earlier. This is one snip, right? So a single mutation in the genome, but it is actually affecting all four of the transcripts of this gene. Um, so that's something that we want to know, right? So we can see now where this um, SNP is located, right? So we now know the exact position of the SNP. Um, so what we can do is we can just take the position, we go to export data, right? And then what do we want? Um, no, we don't want to export the whole gene. So we want to just go to um, summary and say export data. I just want to get a, a position. So go to region detail, then we can zoom and zoom out. And now when we click it, we can actually just select where we want. Right, so I save the location of our SNP. So I'm just going to take this location and then say, select this location, right? And then how much do I want? So in the assignment, we say um, get 600 base pairs in front and 600 base pairs on the back of the SNP. Um, and in this case, we're not going to repeat mask them because we want to use an external tool for that. Um, so have, we have selected our SNP. We have uh, 600 base pairs in front, 600 base pairs in the back. Uh, we click next and then we just say text and we get our FASTA sequence here. And of course, every line in a FASTA sequence is generally 60 long. Right, so this is six. Uh, one, this is base pair one to sixty, um, base pair sixty-one to one hundred and twenty, and so on. And we can see that there's one left over, right? Because we select one position and then six hundred. So in total, we are downloading twelve hundred and one um, in total. All right, so let's copy this and then go to the next question. Um, how long is the exported sequence? So the exported sequence is 1201 base pairs. Um, at which uh, location is the SNP located? Well, it's located exactly in the middle, right? So, and because that's, that's what I asked Ensemble to do. Um, and normally you would want to verify like with your eyes to make sure that the SNP that you are looking at, which is probably this one here, um, is actually the SNP that you're looking for. It's really easy to just make a small typo, um, and that's why I generally copy paste um, the location instead of just writing it down and then typing it in. So just to prevent making any errors. All right, so use repeat masker. Um, so let's go to repeat masker. Let me just repeat masker. Those are the results. I don't want that. So I just want to go to repeatmasker.org and I want you just mask repeat. So I give it my sequence. Um, then I want to say, well, which DNA source do I have? So unfortunately, they do not provide cows as a standard selectable option. So we have to say mammal other than below. 
Um, so and of course the return format I want to get it in HTML and then I'm just going to say submit it and this shouldn't take too long um, so what repeat masker does is it's a very important step because when you are designing primers you don't want to design primers to repeated regions like we discussed last time um, because then your primers will not be unique right so unfortunately we ended up in the queue so it might be taking a little bit longer um, but as so repeat masking is one of these most important steps because this makes sure um, that we are not um, designing primers which are um, targeting repeated regions yeah, but when you look here then you can also see that it actually checks for other things like retrovirus sequences and these kinds of things right so of course we also don't want to design primers into have into retrovirus sequences so it gives us here the overview so there's um, one simple repeat in there of, of 24 base pairs and there's a low complexity area of around 30 base pairs and then here all the way at the bottom we have our um, format and we are just going to say um, i want to have the masked file so when i look at the masked file then we see that very close to the snip of interest it actually blocked out a part of the sequence using ends right so we can see here that there's like 30 uh, like 60 ish base pairs that have been blanked out um, so these 60 base pairs should not be used um, to design our primer all right so let's take this then we go to primer 3 so primer 3 is where we can design our primers so we just give it the sequence that we're interested in I'm going to say pick our left primer pick a right primer um, and then what do I want to target well I want to target of course position 601 because that is the position where our snip is in um, and then I'm going to say comma 1 because I want to target this region with one base pair surrounding it I don't want to exclude regions or these kinds of things so this is very useful when you start designing like multiplex primers or other more complicated primers and then we do want to start excluding regions or having very specific target regions where we want to put our primers in right so the exclude region is where do I not want to have a primer and include region is where do I want to have a primer right so in theory we could say um, I want to have an include region so I want my primer to start at least 30 or 40 or 60 base pairs before 601 and of course this matters when you start sequencing um, because when you start sequencing then the first like 30 to 60 base pairs generally are very low quality so you want the, the piece of DNA that you take out of the animal or take out of the human um, if you are planning on sequencing it you want to have your primer like 100 base pairs in front um, so then you can use the include region uh, to make sure um, that you get a primer there or you use the exclude region and you exclude everything from 500 to 700 base pairs anyway um, this is all the settings that we need to do because we're only interested in making a primer um, quick and dirty um, so we're just going to say pick primer and then it very quickly pricks a primer for us so if we zoom out a little bit we can see that uh, the target snip is here at position 601 um, and then here we see um, our first primer that was picked and then we see here the reverse primer that was picked um, we can see here that the TMs of the primer are very close together there's only 0 0.4 degrees Celsius difference so these primers should work very well together um, you can see that there's no hairpins or no other things which are influencing the primer of course the more or the more difficult your primer design is like if you're trying to design a primer for like all four transcripts at the same time but these transcripts have slight differences to each other and then of course it becomes harder and harder for the program to pick proper primers um, for some reason the length of the right primer is only 18 base pairs no idea why it didn't pick a 20 base pair primer um, but in theory if we don't like the primers then it also suggests some some backups so let me see um, use primer 3 um, you have to use the target option so that's what we did so that was the last one so these are the two primers which are recommended by primer 3 and it gives us four backup alternatives in case we don't we don't like the primer that was picked good so those were the answers I hope they were not too hard it was just like going to database downloading your sequence going to repeat masker and then repeat masking out um, just to make sure of course one thing that we need to do here we see it's a T right um, so we can go back to ensemble and then go back to our snip right to just make sure 
um, that we have uh, the right one because of course um, we want to make sure that this snip is actually a t to something snip um, so when I search then indeed we can see that this snip transforms the t so some animals have a t and some animals have an a um, so but the reference is the t um, which lines up with our primer 3 output so we did a good job we picked a proper primer um, so that's perfect good so those were the assignments um, let me switch back good 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 so for today um, databases like what are they how are they organized what features do they have what types of different databases are out there um, I want to talk a little bit about data normalization because that's an important skill when you're designing your own database um, but it's also an important skill when you're kind of collecting your own data so the 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 kind of rules for data normalization uh, don't just apply for databases they also apply for text files on your hard drive um, and then the list of important biological databases just so that you have two slides which mention all of the main databases um, and most of these databases have already been discussed in the previous lectures and then biomart um, just because it's an amazing tool that you can use to um, download data directly from ensemble into R um, and you can search and query so it's it's one of these tools that you use a lot when you're a bioinformatician and like I said we will have a small example on the slides um, but if there's any time left then I will just kind of program for you guys live um, some biomart stuff because I have to do it for the um, basic op conference anyway so why not just have you guys look in while I'm working good so a database I first wanted to start off with some terminology I think this is a little bit of an, an, uh, an a duplicate slide because we already had terminology on web servers databases and API's um, but a web server is a computer system that processes requests via HTTP which is the protocol um, that allows computers to talk to each other um, and had this is the basic protocol to distribute information on the World Wide Web although no one calls it the World Wide Web anymore so a web server is one part of the equation generally right because when we go to ensemble then we see the, have we send a request and then we get a web page back but of course ensemble itself is nothing more than a big collection of databases behind these web servers so a database is an organized collection of data the data is typically organized to model aspects of reality in a way that supports processes that require this information right so a database is is kind of a, a generalized structure of reality so it tries to model reality in a way um, but it also tries to um, have this modeling process in such a way that it that you can easily query it and that you can easily find what you want to find and then an API is an application programming interface uh, an application programming interface is nothing more than generally a web server um, which allows you to do direct queries to a database but API's are used in in many different terms or it, as a term it's used quite frequently in a lot of fields um, but API's are things like Biomart right so Biomart is an API which allows you to query the ensemble database um, and download data on large scale so why do we use databases well databases are like I told you guys an entity relationship model of real-world processes so a database allows us to kind of beforehand say well the world is structured in this way um, but it's a very limited way of, of describing the world right um, so had the design reflects the functionality and it has the following features so one of the features is that data is abstracted um, so had there's a, a level of ab abstraction in your data had because you're saying that well for example we have a person and a person has a home address but a person also has a phone number and a person has like things that they like right and and you put persons into one data table the phone numbers go into a different table um, then you have a table for addresses um, so had this is an abstraction um, and it allows you to to have like uh, a kind of structured overview of what you can put in 
Databases provide a way of data simplification because like things, uh, data that is common can be deduplicated. So you don't put in duplicate data into a database. No, you just have a table and then you refer from one table to the other table. And that means that you, you just kind of have a link, right? So you don't have to write down the same street name like a hundred times in the same table. No, you just have one table, which is person. You then have a table, which is addresses. And if two people live at the same address, then they just have a kind of pointer um, from the person table to the address table. So that allows you to simplify data and remove duplication. Um, it allows you to structure and organize data in a, in a predetermined plan. Um, and it also makes data searchable. It also provides some level of data visualization, especially for the database schema. So the database schema is the way that um, is a description which shows how the data is organized. Um, and this, this, this schema of a database can be visualized and can give you some insights into how you have modeled the, the entity relationship model. So there are a lot of advantages of using databases. Um, a lot of people say, well, but your hard drive in your computer is also a database. That is true, um, but databases provide much more than just a basic hard drive, right? So and one of the things that databases are really good at is storing large amounts of data and making subsets of that data, right? So instead of having to go through like one big file on your hard drive trying to find the information that you're interested in, hey, a database can do that for you, right? So a database stores all of this data, but when you ask a question, it only gives you the data back that you, that you are interested in. You can access it in parallel. And this is really, really useful because like if you are working on and so something like ensemble literally has millions and millions of users and all of these people are asking questions at the same time and the nice thing is is that because databases allow you to access things in parallel all of these millions of questions can be done more or less simultaneously right and the, you don't have to wait for some other dude's process or question to have finished before you can do it. And that, that is different from um, hard drives. Hard drives also have some parallel access, um, but databases can be like large scale parallel, um, even across multiple locations, right? So data redundancy is also something that a database gives you. Um, data redundancy, like hey, if you look at the Amazon web servers, um, then head a website like Facebook is not located physically in a single data center, but Facebook itself is more or less distributed around the whole world. And it has like hundreds of data centers. Each of these data centers make it so that um, the data is stored redundantly. So if someone is crazy enough to blow up one of the data centers from Facebook, then um, Facebook doesn't go down um, because another data center will just take over serving the requests. It also provides some data protection. Um, things, uh, many databases provide like integrity checks for data. So a, a random like muon which flies through space and hits your hard drive will sometimes change one or two bits on the hard drive. And of course, a database can detect that data has changed and can repair data. Um, and it provides data independence as well because it liberates the data from the format. Um, so that means that hey, you, can, you can query data um, without knowing the format in which it is stored. So if the guys at Facebook or some other company decide to change the way that their data is structured, then you as a user of this database um, are generally not bothered by it because the question that you ask is still giving you back the same data. And the question generally also specifies the format that you want your data in. So it, it allows people to change the way that they store data easily um, without the user being bothered by the way that the data is stored. So if we look at database features, then hey, since we're talking mostly about bioinformatics databases and not so much about Facebook databases, then the databases that we are interested in differ in many aspects, right? We have already seen DNA databases, so databases which only contain data on, on the DNA level. Um, for example, dbSNP is a database which is involved in uh, single nucleotide polymorphisms. And this, this database, of course, only stores DNA uh, modifications. 
We have data, uh, we have databases which focus on proteins like uh, PDB, um, but we also have gene expression data, right? So a database which is only focused on storing gene expression data. When you are looking at a database, you have to make sure that you are um, looking at the quality of the data into the database, right? So there's a big difference uh, between a database which provides raw submitted entries like dbSNP. So these are not curated at all. Anyone um, with a computer and an internet connection can add data to this database. Um, and of course, that makes the data shaky in a way. Right, because anyone can put any data in there, um, you end up with kind of a situation like Facebook and news, right? So anyone can post on Facebook. So the quality of the stuff that you read on Facebook, you have to really be careful about. Then there's other databases which use computer annotation like Tremble. We will talk more about the Tremble database. Um, but this is a database which um, uses a computer or computer algorithms to annotate the data that's in there. Um, and this provides kind of a medium level of quality, right? So because the computer is not a human, so it has no knowledge about current biology or current like new uh, trends or something um, but hey, the computer annotation is just nice but it's not a hundred percent reliable right because it's based on some algorithm that someone wrote um, there can be like bugs in these algorithms and we will see one of these examples where a computer annotated database went completely wrong um, and um, that means that a lot of people thought that the data that they got from the database was actually reliable um, but um, it turned out not to be so reliable as that people thought. So the highest level of quality is when you have manually curated databases. So for example, Swissprot is one of the databases where, um, where they have protein information and the people at Swissprot employ data curators and those are people that look at the data. Um, they are people that work in the field and they read the papers and they make sure that the data which is in the database is exactly the way that it is described in the paper. Right. So here there's a human looking at the submitted data and um, that, that just gives you more um, more reliability of the data, right? So it's an expert in the field curating the data, um, which is completely different than a raw submitted entry. Two types of accessibility. Um, some databases are only human readable, which of course is, is a drawback for bioinformatics because in, di in bioinformatics we want to have a, 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 a database which is computer readable, right? Or at least which presents us with an API so we can directly query the database and get the data out that we want. Um, but there are databases which are only human readable. And of course, there are many types of specializations, right? A DNA database can specialize on single nucleotide polymorphisms like dbSNP um, or on repeated sequences or databases which only look at alternative splicing of genes. Um, yeah, so they, they look at the different transcripts that come from a single gene product. So some general advice when you write a paper in the future um, and you have to use databases for data sources, um, there is a um, there is the nucleic acid research paper or journal. So this is a journal and every January they have uh, something which is called the database issue. And because it's a very dynamic landscape, some databases are there forever, like Ensemble, it's been there since like 1994. Um, so it's a very reliable database and it won't just go away. But other databases might be discontinued because funding ran out or other issues were detected or generally it's funding running out so that people can continue the database. Um, and new databases also pop up, right? Um, if we think about things like microRNAs, uh, we know now that microRNAs are very important, but like 30 years ago, no one would have made a database for microRNAs because people weren't they weren't even discovered yet, right? And the, the database issue, which is always in January, uh, gives you a really, really good overview. So if you if you want to know what's hip and happening in the database world, um, or in biology, of course, um, then um, head, uh, 
take the January issue of uh, nucleic acid research. Um, and of course, for people who design databases and make databases, it's always a big push to get their database published in this um, uh, January issue of, of NAR, um, because it has a very large um, audience. All right, so get an overview of the content. Have You have to, of course, when you pick a database to do your analysis with, um, look at the release notes, look at the database statistics and these kinds of things and to get an information like, does it provide the animal that I'm currently working on? Um, hey, is the data easily accessible, easily queried? Um, can I use things like um, APIs to download my data? Um, had the release notes, if you see that the latest release was five years ago, um, then of course, like this database might not be the most up to database that you want to use. Of course, you have to find out how you provide information to the database, right? Because when you're searching for some data, then you have to make sure that you have the right identifiers, right? If I'm working with um, genes, then every gene has an ensemble gene ID. So that is the name that Ensemble gave the gene. But other databases like Entres, they use their own naming system. So if I have um, my data annotated using Ensemble IDs, um, then of course I cannot use a database which requires me to input Entres IDs. And there's a lot of tools allowed that allow you to go from one type of identifier to another type of identifier. Um, but it's important for you to know how to query data from the database. Um, and you, you want to know things like sequence, what kind of formats do I need to provide or can I provide? And the main thing is, of course, as a bioinformatician, I am always interested if there is a batch retrieval system. Because I, as a bioinformatician, am not going to go to a database and start clicking around and downloading data, making my own Excel file. No, I, I just want to be able to directly talk to the database and retrieve um, half of the data which is in there. And maintenance is also one of these things. Hey, is it maintained at a regular base? Uh, because a lot of databases, they, they get published, they become very popular, people use them for a very short time very intensively um, but then a new beta database comes up which has better algorithms in annotating the data and everyone switches from one database to the other one so if you are trying to, or if you're thinking about using a database make sure that you see other publications and that other people are using your database in recent publications right because it might be that you spend a lot of time writing your code to download data from database A, but database A was the one that was hip and happening in 2018, but in 2022, we use a completely different hip and happening database. Um, so if it is used by others in publication, that's generally um, an indication that the database is, is a good database to use. So if we talk about databases and types of databases, we have two different types of databases. Um, so we have the object relational database, which is the most common type of database. So it is a tabular layout of the data. So you have rows and columns. Um, generally, you query it using um, SQL, so structured query language. Um, and it, it couples different of these tabular layouts together using a primary key uh, foreign key relationship. So we will talk about why this is, but these, the object relational databases are the most common one. So when people talk about things like MySQL or ProgressQL, um, they are talking about object relational databases. Since like five, six years, um, there is another type of database which has made its entry, which is the NoSQL database, or they are also called triple stores. Um, so these are databases which are not using tables. They are databases which just have um, triples in there, very similar to the site escape format, right? So you have object, relation, object, and you have millions and millions of entries. And that is how they store their data. And the nice thing about this is, is that you can do semantic queries because the semantic queries means is that you can ask things, uh, the database can better understand what is in the data in a way. Um, so a semantic query, um, an SQL query is select from this table everything where this column is having a value lower than X. But a semantic query would be something like show me all of the things related to 
a certain concept, right? And a triple star can do that because it has, it knows what the relationship is between two objects, right? So it can, it can reason about objects as well. It can know that if A is connected to B versus a certain relationship and B is connected to C via, via the same relationship, then A is also connected to C via B, right? So it can, it can, it can see the data in a way. So, but I don't want to talk too much about NoSQL and triple stars because they are not used that much, but they are very important or becoming more and more important in uh, bio, bioinformatics research. Um, and that is because they can be really, really fast, blazingly fast in relationship to standard kind of classical object relational databases. Um, and they, rec they, they allow you to do these semantic queries. So they allow you to, to ask things which you cannot easily ask using SQL, where you're just saying, select from here these things that start with an A. So SQL is the standard language for databases, right? And it's a very simple language, um, and it's often called a CRUD language. So it, it provides four main features, um, actually five, because select also belongs in here. Um, but generally, you have create, read, update, and delete. So, and, and you can create a new entry in a table, you can read an entry in a table, you can update an entry in a table, or you can delete an entry from the table. It is a very easy syntax and it's very much related to English, right? When I told you guys, select star, so everything from this database, from this table, where these things apply, right? That is the way that you write queries in in, in SQL. The SQL language literally has a select something from a table statement. Um, so it is a really easy syntax and it is related to English. Of course, you can, you can merge tables together and have like foreign key restraints and stuff, but it, it is supported by most major databases, which, and even some no SQL databases provide a SQL interface to their database. So one of the drawbacks is, is that in SQL, there are a lot of database specific dialects. So MySQL, it has a slightly different SQL dialect than ProgressQL, which means that queries that work for one database are not like one to one translational to another database engine, so to speak. So there are database specific dialects, which is just something that you have to be aware of. Um, but generally you're, you're within a team or within a university, you're only using a single database system anyway. Um, so you're just learning that dialect, um, but there are like small minor changes to it um, from type of database that you're using. All right, so I talked a little bit about primary keys. So primary keys is a constraint on a table. Right, because if I have a table and I am a database, then I have to be able to identify each row in the table in a unique way. And that is called the primary key. So a primary key is a single column. For example, um, you can just say I have a primary key column, which is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Right, so every, every row just gets the row index as being the primary key. But you can do more advanced things by using combinations of columns, right? So for example, um, uh, if I look at the table here, right, then the primary key in this table is, is made by using the product ID and the vendor ID, right? And that this is because two different vendors can have the same product ID. That's just the way that it works, right? If I order something from... Uh, from uh, MediaMarkt, then MediaMarkt uses codes for their products. But then when I go to Saturn, they use different codes, but these codes might be the same, right? So the nice thing about a primary key is that, is that it's not limited to a single column, but you can also use a combination of columns as the primary key to a table. So the, the goal of a primary key is to uniquely identify each row in the table. This is also, in, uh, the part in red is that, of course, because of this, a table can only contain one primary key constraint. And these are enforced. So if I now, in this database, try to add a new entry 
and this entry again has product ID 609, vendor ID 7, then the database will not allow me to do that. So it provides a data integrity check and you cannot, and because of these primary keys, it's very hard to input data in a database which is um, broken or which is, which is inconsistent. Right, so, so this allows a database to say, well, no, you cannot input this product ID for this vendor ID because it already exists. So primary keys are used in foreign key constraints. Right, so when I build a database, um, for example, a database which looks like this, so it has an artist, and has, so an artist is someone who makes music, uh, then we have recordings, so those are like recordings are defined by album ID, artist, genre, year of release, and these kinds of things. And then we have genres, right? So this database, the artist ID is the primary key for the artist. The genre has an, an, a genre ID, right? Because there's many different artists, there's many different genre, but a single artist can, can make music in, in different different genres and um, in one genre there can be many different uh, different artists right so the idea here is that if you have a recording right so here the primary key for the recording is the album ID right so an album ID is the thing that uniquely identifies a row but because of the foreign key constraint which we can put on the artist ID and the genre ID in the recordings we can make it so that the database will reject recordings for which one of these two is not pointing to a valid source. So if I design my database like this, which have primary keys and they have foreign key constraints, then now when I try to input a recording with an artist ID that does not occur into the artist table, right? Because here there's many different rows, here there's also many different rows, but if I try to insert a recording with an artist ID that does not occur in the database, the database will not allow me to do this. If I, um, the same thing for the genre ID, right? So there's, there's, there's foreign keys are a way so that you can say, well, this column in this table recordings can only contain values which occur in the artist table or contain values which occur in an in the genre table right so and this is the way that data consistency is enforced in an object relational database i hope that's clear um, foreign key constraints take a little while to wrap your head around and of course head a foreign key constraint can also point to a, a multi-column um, um, constraint in another one Right, but generally you have a foreign key constraint is based on a primary key in a different table. Right, so if I have a database which contains three tables, um, then every table has their own primary key. Album ID is also a primary key. I actually forgot to put a little red box on, on this. Um, but the, f the foreign key um, is just a way to enforce data consistency. All right, so I want to talk to you guys a little bit about database normalization and there are an official kind of, hey, if you, if you do computer science, people always talk about databases, normal form five, normal form three, normal form eight, um, but I don't want you guys to know it in this much detail, right? I want you guys to, to kind of understand what normalization is, right? So they can have different levels of normalization, but I don't require for you guys that you know that all of the requirements for a normal form one database or a normal form two database, right? But data normalization is the process of organizing the columns, the attributes and the tables, so the relations of a relational database to reduce data redundancy and improve data integrity, right? So for example, we can have um, something like this, right? Where we have a denormalization step. So this is more normal than this right so but what we do here is we have a table called names and we have a table called uh, addresses right and then we have a constraint between the names and the addresses hey, which says that here um, the name shift so some guy named Shiv is living in Mumbai in India um, we have a guy called Raju which is also living in Mumbai India and you can see of course that this 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 table addresses will have like a, a massive amount of repeat in there 
So we can denormalize this data, right? Because this is the way that databases tell you to do it. But this is this is overkill, right? So in this case, you could denormalize the data and say, well, no, we just have a, a single table which has a name, address one, and an address two. Of course, this has a big, big drawback as well. If now we want to store a third part of the address, for example, the continent, then we can't do that. Well, we can do that in the in the normalized form, right? We could just add another row saying Shift um, Asia, Raju Asia, and that this will allow us to store data in a different way than than this, right? And this limits us. So generally, it's better to go and denormalize your data or to normalize your data, and so to have a, a a separation between humans and addresses right because humans are not addresses and addresses are not humans you don't want to put them into a single table no you want to split these this information across these two tables and of course this address table will become very very long and that is in this case okay depending on your use case if you know for certain that there will be no one in your database that has three different uh, uh, that requires three address fields um, then you would do it like this yeah, but here, data normalization is also a way of, of kind of feeling or, or, or having a, a feeling for what is the best way to, to chop up your data into different data tables and use these foreign key constraints and these primary keys. Right, so here we see the three different normal forms. So the first normal form, you want to remove duplicate data and break data at a very granular level. So that means going from a table like this into a table like this. The second normal form means that all column data should depend fully on the primary key and not a part of the primary key. Then the third normal form is that no column should depend on other columns. So hey, this is this is the way that we would normalize. But I'm not here for you guys to. Hey, so the first thing, granularity, is to break your data down in logical pieces. Right, so if we have um, a table which holds student names, um, then we can just have a single column called student name, which then has the whole name of the student in there. However, it is better to break your data down into more granular level because then you can kind of do different queries, right? If we just break the name down into three parts, saying that no, every name of every student is composed of three different parts, you have a first name, you have a middle name, and you have a last name. Then, of course, now we can say, well, give me all the students whose middle name is Haringish, or give me every student for which the last name is this. Right? And that allows our database to do subqueries, because a database generally cannot look into the values inside of a single column, but it can, it can use a selector on a column. So we can say only show students uh, for which the last name is uh, Koirala. Right? And then you only get the first two. Right? So granularity is very important also when you're, when you're storing your own data. Right? So when you, when you do experiments, um, then your experimental data, you generally want to find a, a, a logical granularity for your data. Of course, you can go too far in this as well, right? Too much granularity can be very bad as well. Like things like phone numbers, it makes no sense to um, to split your phone number into three different parts, like a region code, area code, phone extension code, because you're never going to ask, show me all of the phone numbers where the the phone extension is 7100. Right? That doesn't really make sense. Or show, well, you might want to select by area code. right? You might want to see all of the phone numbers in your database which are located into a certain area code. Um, but generally, this is called over decomposition. right? So, so breaking down your data, so taking a single column which has kind of composite data and breaking it down across multiple columns is called decomposing your data, making it more granular. Um, but you can, of course, over decompose your data as well, which means that you take something which is a single unit and now start breaking it up into kind of smaller units. But these smaller units don't really, really um, make that much sense. Um, but this is, of course, very, um, very much based on, on your wishes that you have. What do you want to do with the data later on? 
we can also have one of the reasons why we use databases is to not duplicate data all the time. But a lot of times, and you see this a lot in bioinformatics, is that when you get data, data is non-uniform. So here you see we have this column called the standard, right? So fifth standard or sixth standard. But because this, this column here is not a foreign key constraint or a primary key, this is just a free column. So you can put in this column whatever you want. But some people will write fifth standard like this and other people will write fifth standard like this, right? So now I am unable to select from this, from this little table all of the individuals which have the fifth standard because of the way that it's written in different ways, right? So generally, if you have these non-uniform duplicate data, and this occurs a lot, also with experimental data, right? If I am writing down, um, so let me give you an example. Um, recently, we've been doing uh, research on BXD mice. And before these BXD mice are slaughtered and all of these things and taken apart and, and, and how we measure all kinds of, of things on these mice, we do a physical inspection of the mouse. But when I am visually inspecting the mouse, I will use different names for colors than one of my colleagues is, right? I might call it brown while they might call it light brown and or dark brown, right? They might, they might make a distinction between these two colors, but I just call it brown, right? So, so this is non-uniform data. Um, the same thing happens like I was scoring mice and I was looking at their back and then sometimes the mouse has a little hump, right? And, and I call this, like I score the hump in three levels. So I say it, it has no hump, it has a medium hump, or it has a very severe hump. But a colleague of mine just scored yes, no. Right, so then, then you cannot use this data in the end for things like statistical modeling. Because when you do statistical modeling, you want to have a uniform description of something. Right, so how do we solve this? Well, the way to solve this is to use these foreign key constraints. Right, so we have a, a, a primary key here, but now we just make a new table. So we have the table with students, and then we have a table with standards. Right, so we have the fifth standard, the sixth standard, this is called ID1, this is called ID2, and when we input the standard at which a certain student was scored, we just use this one or two. And now it's impossible for me to put something into the database um, which is different than fifth standard or sixth standard. Right, so it helps the consistency of the data, and it means that in the end, when we want to do statistics on our data, we have a uniform description of the data, and we have kind of a, 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 a more logical divide of our data. Another rule in database design and databases is that you never store derived data. Right, so if we have a, a student table, right, where we have the total marks and the total subjects, we don't have a column called average, right? Average is just dividing the total marks divided by the subject, right? So 100 divided by 10, but we never do that. So derived data or data that can be computed from other columns should not occur in the table. And this also holds for data files that you make yourself or that you, 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 you have other people or other students make for you. So because this is easily computable. You do not want to store the results. You just want to compute it when you need it um, instead of having an extra column into the database, making the database bigger, slower, and all of these things, right? So never store any derived data. There is an exception for when the computation is extremely heavy, right? If calculating the average takes you two days of computers, uh, computer time or two days of CPU time, then of course it is okay to store the average. But in, in this case, average is just dividing two numbers, so it's computed really, really quickly. Um, so you should never store the average into the database. Good, so I've been talking for an hour. It's going really quick. I actually expect it to be much further into the presentation already it doesn't matter um, so for you guys um, if there's no questions so far I will take a little break and you guys can take like a 10 minute break as well 
Um, and then we will um, talk about um, our SQL Lite. So this is a way that you can make a database in R and use this database. Good. So I don't see any questions in chat. So I will be back in 10 minutes. So that's at 2.10. Um, so you guys enjoy um, the first break. Um, so I forgot what it was. It's either goats or what's the other one? I think it's goats this time because I've been working on goat data like the whole week. Um, so yeah, I'm going to take a 10 minute break. Um, I'm also going to run an ad break though so that people joining do not get the uh, um, the, the pre-roll ads. Um, I think those are enabled so when people join the stream they have to watch 30 seconds of ads and I can just run like a one minute ad for everyone who's watching currently and then you guys can just well, people coming in don't have it. All right, so I will see you guys in 10 minutes. So have a coffee, have a short break, and I will be back very, very, very soon. So. <laughs> 